Hello and good evening. Um, I'm David Levine. I'm co-chair of Science Writers in New York. Um, behind the camera is my, my co-chair, Joe Bonner, who is recording this and working the audio magic and also we'll put this on YouTube. My guest tonight is Sue Shapiro. I'm going to introduce her, but I probably will introduce her again because it takes a while for people to get in the room. Um, we have over 250 people registered for tonight. Wow. Which is pretty good. Um, Susan is the best-selling author or co-author of 17 books her family hates. And she told that, she said, I can leave that in, even though her mother is listening in. Um, including Five Men Who Broke My Heart, Lighting Up, Unhooked, The Bosnia List, The Writing Guide, The Byline Bible, and a recent memoir, The Forgiveness Tour. She lives with her scriptwriter husband in Greenwich Village, where she's taught her popular instant gratification, takes too long courses at the New School, NYU, Columbia University, and in private classes and seminars, which are now online. And, um, and tonight we're going to discuss her new book, which is the Book Bible, How to Sell Your Manuscript, No Matter What Genre, Without Going Broke or Insane. Um, so, first of all, this book was supposed to be published this week, and it's been pushed back a little bit. So, I think it'll be published in February now? Yeah, now they're saying February. Okay, and... Uh, I think that's par for the course for a lot of different things going on. Yeah, supply chain problems. Yes. Um, so um, why'd you write the book? Well, they always say you should teach the class you wanted to take and write the book you wanted to read. And it took me, I started writing full time when I was 20, when I moved to New York, and it took me until age 43 until I got my first book deal from Random House. So after 23 years, I was an overnight success and it took a lot of time to figure out books. Basically, nobody really explains it to you. I was an undergrad with great English teachers who had books out. I have my master's in creative writing. I worked at the New Yorker. Nobody explains books to you. It just takes a million years. Every genre is different. Poetry is different than short stories, is different than novels, is different than YA. Nobody explains it to you. It's just even an agent. I mean, they can give you brief information, but it's just really, really hard to understand where you should start, what genre would be best. Um, you know, do you need a book? Do you need a whole proposal? Uh, do you have to get published first? You know, and it, so it just took me so many years to figure this out. Now that I figured it out and I have, I think I have um, books out in eight different genres. Now I have this great overview and I find myself with a lot of my students they'll mention a book and they'll, they're, they've had no luck selling a memoir for three years. And they happen to mention that it's, uh, the protagonist is 14. So I'll be like, well, why isn't it a YA book? That's much easier. And they're like, really? Nobody ever told me that. So I, I just kept doing this over and over and over where I would help people sell books that um, nobody else could figure out. And I realized, you know, I just really got to write this down and help people. So that's how it started. Well, I got a master's degree in creative writing also at Johns Hopkins and they don't, nobody discusses money, no one discusses anything practical. I think that's true in you know, law school as well. I think it's true in other- Well, with law school, medical school, and business school, there is a certain plan that you follow and they do help with internships and residencies and right. they, do, they do help you externally in our fields, they don't. And part of the reason is that there's no one way to do it. There's a million ways to do it. And uh, yeah, and also some people think it's sacrilegious to mention it. Um, I mean, I, so after my two degrees, which cost thousands of dollars and took six years, um, nobody, I didn't even know how to write a cover letter to send out one of the pieces I'd been, I'd spent six years on. So again, what, what's sort of cool for me is that I found a niche because, you know, I was in my own program, I was studying with, you know, E.L. Doctorow and Sharon Oles and, um, you know, Lucille Clifton and Huda Amichai and, and, and Joseph Brodsky. So I, I, I can't really compete with them, but there is this one little, there was this one gap in my knowledge that nobody was really filling in. So luckily that was a good place for me to expand. And I found very early on 
teaching at NYU in the new school and bringing in editors and agents, kids went crazy because nobody was doing it. So that's that's why I wound up doing it more. Yeah. So for people listening in, um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box. Don't put it in the chat box because that's just um, for Sue and I and uh, Joe to communicate if there's a problem. Um, so um, there are some questions that people did submit in advance, so I'm going to read some of those to you. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, is a short nonfiction proposal okay? Short hook, meaty market analysis, one to two line summary per chapter and outline, three comps and sample chaps on the shorter side and so forth. Would, well, 40, would 40 to 70 pages be adequate? That, that sounds like a lot. When you read Book Bible, which you can pre-order and it'll be there very soon, there's an entire chapter on what you need for a nonfiction proposal. So it's all, all the information is there. I would say every single project is 100% different based on everything, based on the subject, based on your platform, based on uh, you know the interest level, uh, based on what you've written before, how well you write. So there is no rule. So one person, I have a student who sold a huge book to Random House on 10 pages. Um, I have another student who had to write the entire manuscript and it took six years before she got a book deal with the whole manuscript. So it just, it depends on everything. There's not, unfortunately, there's no one rule. There are some basic things that you could, some templates that I try to supply, but there's not an easy answer. And even, for example, with a memoir, some people are buying, some editors are buying memoirs on a manuscript. Some people are buying them on a full proposal. Some people want both. And some people see one short piece in the New Yorker, the New York Times, and say, I want this book and buy it off of two pages. So no, there's no rule. OK, so in the chat section, you can look for, there's a link for Susan's book. Thank so you, you can pre-order that. And um, I'm sure you can also find it on her website. So someone wants to know, are you doomed if you pitch but don't have a great social media following? Depends. It depends if you have like this hot, you know, expose that about somebody famous that nobody in the world has, it doesn't matter if you have social media, you know, so, so it, it depends on if, if you've written this gorgeous, amazingly beautiful novel, then, you know, no, then they might not care that you have no social media, you know, so again, it depends on the project, it depends on your writing, depends on your platform, you know, so there is no rule. Um, Dan Meneker, who was the the editor in chief of Random House, who's an old friend of mine, I once asked him about it. And he, his answer to me was people think publishing is a business, but it's really a casino. So that, I found that, that to be helpful. <laughs> I mean, so in my 20s, I had a photographer, um, a girlfriend who's a photographer, and she said, um, photography is the one thing you don't have to, you know, if you have the picture that everyone wants, like, and she gave the example of, picture of John Lennon signing the record album Double Fantasy for the person who later killed him. So that person walked into the Daily News, made a deal in five minutes and, you know, and so that's, that's, well, you know, that's, they, that's, that's they, a rare thing. What do I need for an editor to buy my book? Well, they need to fall in love with it. Well, how do you define that? You don't, you know, it's just, it's, it's not definable necessarily. Okay. It, it, that doesn't mean, I mean, there's a great line, the harder I work, the luckier I get. So it doesn't mean, you know, in, in the book, in, in Book Bible, I give, you know, in every different genre, 20 different genres, I give very, very specific, um, you know, uh, directives that will help, you know, put you closer to getting a book deal, but nobody can guarantee it. And no matter, you could do a thousand things right and not get a book deal, you could do everything wrong and stumble onto something. So, you know, but there are ways that you can make it more likely to happen. Um, so, you know, I wasn't very impressed with your book because you first, you know, you, you, you know, look into different genres and I, I like to discuss a few of them. And, um, and then you say first, first, what not to do. Like you say, like humor, you say, just send it to Saturday Night Live. You know, don't do that, you know, things like that. Um, so I started out as a poet, you know, poetry major, and as you said, there's nobody who makes a living doing poetry. The, the Johns Hopkins Creative Writing Program was actually designed to give poets um, 
first a place to teach, but mm -hmm. also an advanced degree because most of them did not have an advanced degree so they could teach. Mm -hmm. um, so now you give the example of one, there is one poet in the United States you know, who sold a lot and that was Rod McEwen. And people knock him, but I think he did a pretty good job. He also had musical spe music specials and things. You know, one of the things that I say I think in every chapter over and over again is what's your goal? So yeah. it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to break into the New Yorker or be prestigious or be a poet laureate, Rod McEwen is not your role model. If your goal is to do exactly what you love and do kind of like, you know, sing song kind of folk, folky uh, poem, poems that you like and that's, that, that's popular to make a lot of money, then he is your role model, you know? So you really have to think carefully, what do you want? What do you care about the most? You know, and I have, I mean, in my classes, I'll have 50 people on a Zoom from all over the world and every single person has a different goal. So I think that, you know, one of the things that um, I was very lucky because I had great mentors and great therapy. And one of the things that, um, you know, that I kept being asked over and over is what do you want? What exactly do you want? And, uh, you know, so you got to figure that out. Um, and by the way, the reason I did the um, what's not to, um, you know, what not to do First off, I didn't want to do a boring book with Book Bible. I didn't want to do, you know, self-help can be boring. It's do this, do that, do that. And I, I didn't want to be boring. And so I tried one that I thought was funny and I was worried. And several people in my writing group at the beginning said, you know, it's very sardonic. It's very sarcastic. It's a little flippant. But I noticed the four of the youngest people in the group laughed and said they loved it. And I said, why? And they said, because I do that. I saw myself in it. I saw myself sending a piece to the New Yorker at four in the morning, deciding it was brilliant before I showed it to anyone. And the way that you said it made me realize that wasn't a good idea. So I thought, okay, if the four youngest people in the group thought it was funny and got it, like it, it helped them more, it helped them more to hear what not to do than to hear what to do. So that's why I decided, you know what, it's just fun and I'm going to do it. And also nobody else does that, you know, the, with these writing books, they're so earnest. So I didn't want to, I didn't want it to be boring and earnest. I wanted it to be fun and, and make you laugh and, um, you know, be a little bit uh, sardonic or out there. So that's why I started each chapter that way. So someone wants to know, what was the first piece that you sold? Might have been... I mean, sold. So I published poetry in literary magazines that probably didn't pay. Um, might have been a, uh, I did a piece for Cosmopolitan for I think four or $500 in the 80s, right when I got to New York. So it might have been that. I think maybe, trying to remember, um, I did some book reviews that I got maybe $50 or $100 for maybe early on. And I think a few of the literary magazines may have paid. I think Cosmo once paid me a hundred dollars for a poem, which was felt astronomical at the time. So um, yeah, so I right right when I came to New York when I was twenty, I started writing pretty seriously and trying a lot of things. But there's a lot of publications that don't pay, so I think I did that for a little while. But Cosmo was probably my first real paycheck, and I did a lot of work for them. I mean, I think I got up to five thousand dollars for um, for five thousand word pieces or even twenty five hundred word pieces for them because it was back in the days when they paid a dollar, two dollars a word. So women's magazines were, were pretty good. Yeah, I wrote for them too. Um, so I was thinking about anthologies and you said, sometimes as a writer, it's nice to take a little break and be an editor. I know sometimes when I'm writing something, I said, I wish I was editing something because this is hard work. And then when I'm editing something, you know, I wish I could get back to my writing. So you're never, you're never gonna be totally happy with what you do. But let's, let's talk about anthologies because that's a little different than it's not fiction, it's not a memoir, it's not nonfiction. So what, what makes a good anthology and why don't we explain what, it, what you mean by an anthology? Okay, so usually an anthology is a collection of pieces by different writers. So it's not an essay collection by one writer, it's yeah. there's an editor and then there's a, um, you know, there's, there's a different group of writers. I mean, contemporary, I found 23 writers is fairly common. And uh, usually uh, it's 23, 25 pieces, usually about 3,000 words each, a lot of essay collections out there. I've been in a lot of anthologies, uh, some that have been best selling. The benefit of pitching an anthology is that you can probably, you can probably sell an anthology off of 10 pages. So you could write, it's probably, it could probably be a very short proposal. 
And it could be especially good for people who, who are well connected. So for example, if you're working in the MFA program at NYU Columbia, the new school, um, Iowa, you know, if you know a lot of well-known writers um, who will commit to doing a piece for your anthology, especially original material, you're pretty much, you got, a, you got a good idea, you got six famous people that'll say yes, you might be able to get an anthology deal. Um, and again, as you mentioned, it's good for, it's good for people who maybe have a good idea but are better editors than writers or who feel more confident as editors. Um, yeah, I've been in a whole bunch of them. Uh, the Modern Jewish Girl's Guide to Guilt. I was in uh, one about Madonna. I was in, um, uh, oh, uh, I, I, I love, I love, um, Oh, one, one was a sex anthology. That was funny. I was in a sex anthology by Paula Darrow. And I remember my, my husband said, why would you want to write for that? And I said, you know, something like, well, it's a thousand dollars. He said, well, I'll give you 2000 to not write for it. <laughs> How much would your mother have given you? <laughs> Probably more. But so, um, yeah, so the, the benefits of being in an anthology, the, the benefits of pitching an anthology are um, you don't have to write very much yourself. And if you're a good organizer, if you're good connecting people, if you know people, if you have a great idea, it's easier. That's an easier way to launch an anthology. Um, the downside of it is there tends not to be that much money in it. So, for example, if you get thirty-five thousand advance and then you're paying twenty-three people for their pieces, that doesn't leave too much for you. Um, but again, it depends on your goal. I did an anthology once, a charity anthology called Food for the Soul, and it and um, I was working with Ian Fraser at a um, Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen. Where, so we were doing a workshop for formerly homeless people and, and um, uh, people who'd uh, recently been out of prison. And it was just a very interesting, fascinating group of people. And we wanted to help them and we wanted to help the church. And so we, um, uh, we just did an anthology and we pitched it to a small press who agreed to um, split, the, um, split the advance between the 23 contributors and it wound up on the Today Show and NPR and the New York Times. And it was just to change people's lives. It was really beautiful. So, you know, but again, you have to ask yourself, what's your goal? Is your goal um, to get your name out there? Is it prestige? Is it to do good in the world? Is it to get a book deal the quickest? Um, you know, so, so it depends. Yeah, I've been in anthologies and sometimes it leads to other things because someone, you know, notices and then I was asked to be in a panel in Europe to speak. Yeah, so that was pretty good. Yeah, they can lead to great things. Yeah. So what advice do you have for a procrastinator? And the person who is all over the place with many ideas and not sure which one to hone in on? Well, truthfully, I would say take my class because I have this great five-week pitching class where there's an assignment each week where you have to email me one pitch to one editor and I bring in 15 different editors and all the edit top editors, my favorite, it's just amazing editors now from all over the country on will zoom in and they're very very specific about what they're looking for so they will say you know the new york times and the washington post and the new yorker and new york magazine and um uh newsweek and they'll say this is the kind of pitch that i want this is the thing that i'm looking for and you get to do sort of a q a where you can ask them a lot of questions and you send a pitch and if the editor says yes sometimes they say okay get this to me tomorrow you know, so it just really helps you focus, you know, and you can't give me, I won't look at 10 ideas. I'm only going to look at one idea. So you can throw out one or two ideas in class and then you can hand me one. But I found there's a lot of people that don't know where to start that do the class and that get published really quickly because, you know, if an editor is interested, it just, you know, it just is a very easy way to focus. Um, I also say, check out my book, um, uh, my first book, Byline Bible, um, get published in five weeks, which is very specific about which kind of pieces editors want. But I would say taking a class in general is a great thing to do, especially if you can find a teacher that focuses on getting published or, you know, the exact kind of thing that you want to do. I don't think anybody really does this alone. It's kind of like someone was asking me today, interviewing me about um, getting sober and uh, smoke free, which I did 20 years ago. Nobody really does it alone. It's very collaborative. So, so getting off of addictions is collaborative and getting published is pretty collaborative. So I think that, you know, if you have support, it just makes it a million times more likely to happen. If you're sitting alone in your apartment, it makes it much less likely to happen. So someone says, how do you know what a good idea is? How do you decide whether it's better to keep trying to sell a project, bending it this way and that, or better to move on? 
And how did well, you yeah. and how did you not lose hope in the twenty three years of not getting a book published? Okay, well, the first first thing is, as I just mentioned, classes. There's a way for you to get feedback from professionals that lets you know if the idea is good or not. So I'm in a class, I'm not shy with someone, someone will throw out an idea and I'll be like, that's 47 years old, it's 2022. Why would anyone buy that? Don't you have anything more timely? You know, so if you get in a, if you get a teacher or a mentor who's just honest with you, you know, and you'll get feedback from the class. And so you'll hear, and by the way, every once in a while, someone will throw out an idea and it'll be like, wow, oh my God. And an editor will go crazy over it. And you can just sense that it's a good idea, but you're also getting feedback. There's a lot of ways to get feedback. One is in a class. Um, one is I have a, um, a, I started my own writing group with really tough critics. So that's a good way. Another way is you could pay ghost editors to help you. You could pay um, coaches. Uh, they're, they're, they're great um, writing coaches who you could throw out material and they'll give you advice. Um, actually, I recently sold, I sold three books in 2021 during the pandemic. And um, part of the way that I did it was I hired a fantastic ghost editor. There's a, a ghost editor um, who is a former executive editor at St. Martin's Press, Brenda Copeland. And now she, that's all she does is she, she is a ghost editor for um, freelance projects. And so you can actually hire someone who was, you know, high level at a book publishing house and they will just go over your work line by line and help you. And that just makes it a million times more likely it's going to happen. You know, so, so I think, again, the trick is um, sitting alone in your apartment. It's probably not going to happen or in your basement or, you know, in your house. It's, it's, a, it's very collaborative. And my shrink told me a long time ago, hang out with people you want to be. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I mean, even just being on this Zoom here and you're talking to an author who has 17 books out, you know, so, so um, uh, you know, and, and reading book Bible. I mean, I, I probably interviewed a hundred top, you know, executives on every level, literary agents and book editors um, to help me with uh, book Bible. So, you know, go get advice and, and people can email me if they want, um, information about my classes, about other classes, you know, look at the, um, if you want to take a, a writing class in your genre, Google the teacher and see what their background is, you know, so, so if you're going to take a memoir class, see if the, if the teacher has published a memoir that you admire, um, you know, if you could afford it, hire a ghost editor or hire a coach, you know, so there's a lot of ways that you could make it a million times more likely for you to get published and for you to get a book deal. Mm -hmm. In terms of, in terms of if I got frustrated, um, you know, one of the things that was going on was I was a very successful freelance writer. So I was selling pieces to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and, you know, millions of newspapers and magazines. So that was exciting. Um, and I also, at a certain point, I was freelancing by day and teaching by night. So, um, you know, I felt like I had two good careers. It took me a long time to crack books. Um, but I was in anthologies. It kept getting closer and closer and I didn't give up. And, and truthfully, I'll, I'll, also, I really did have a great therapist. And one of the things that coincided was I couldn't figure out why so many students in my classes were getting published, uh, publishing books through short pieces. And I wasn't, and I was frustrated. And I felt like the wedding planner who couldn't get married. And um, I went to therapy to try to, I was turning 40 and I couldn't quit smoking and drinking and pod and all this stuff. And the shrink actually said to me that, that he felt that all my bad habits were kind of clogging up my brain and it was making it harder to sustain a long narrative, you know, cause I said, well, I'm successful. I do all these other pieces. He's yeah, but they're short. They're 900 words. They're a thousand words. And he actually explained to me, <clears throat> it was sort of an interesting explanation of how as an addict, I wasn't, um, I wasn't able to stay with anything negative for a long time. I was smoking it away, drinking it away, you know, fucking it away, eating it away. You know, you just, you, you, an addict doesn't want to stay with anything negative. And so what, when I did my addiction therapy, um, he actually said to me, if you stay in addiction therapy for a year, at the end of a year, you're going to be done with smoking and drinking. And, and I bet you're going to sell a book. And by the end of a year, I had sold three books to Random House, you know, so there really was a psychological element to there were things that I was doing that was that, that was making it less likely, really bad habits that was making it less likely for me to get a book deal. And when I cleared my brain and really made a, a very good plan and like woke up and wrote every day and then delegated and used a ghost editor, I had like this whole plan, which is part of what I share in Book Bible. And not only did it work, you know, I'm, I'm on book 17, you know, so it works so well that it's very exciting and I, I never stopped. Okay, so someone asked, it's kind of a long question, so it says, 
When it comes to the fiction novel, assuming a first time author published to an established publishing house, publishing house, what is a feasible, the average number of copies printed or sold? If also, if you have an novel you've been working on for a long time and aren't necessarily financially motivated, would it be better to aim for an agent established publisher? Um, okay, well, first of all, first of all, and by the way, I, I also teach a how to sell your book class, which I'm gonna do again later in the winter. And a lot of people have gotten agents and book deals that way. So first of all, you, you don't really wanna say a fiction novel because if you say fiction, it is non, you know, so, so it, every novel is fiction. And, and you gotta watch the terminology, especially if you're gonna to go to agents and editors and there, you also don't say fictional memoir. So a novel's fiction, the only distinctions I hear people make are, is it YA, young adult, middle grade or an adult book? And then sometimes refer to, people refer to, is it literary, is it commercial? Um, I would say, um, I mean, I have a whole chapter in Book Bible about how to, how to publish a novel, but I would say, you know, if you write the whole thing, you know, a really great thing to do, if you could afford it, is after you write it and re revise it, um, either take a class where the teacher is a novelist, a known novelist. Um, at, like, for example, Jennifer Bell is a colleague of mine who's a, uh, a novelist with a lot of books out, and she teaches a class. And they go over chapter by chapter by chapter and you get critiqued in the class. So that's a good thing to do if you, if you can do that. Um, if you can afford it, if you don't want to go that route, if you don't have that much time or you don't want to be in a classroom setting, hire a ghost editor. You know, I, I know tons of great ones. Like I said, I hired Brenda and she helped me sell three books. Brenda Copeland is brilliant. And you can hire a ghost editor who can, it, it's the equivalent of working with someone at a top publishing house that'll tell you the truth and you'll go back and forth and they'll help you and they'll tell you the truth. Sometimes they'll say, you know, this doesn't work or, you know, the tense is off or, you know, it really doesn't get rolling until chapter four, cut out the first four chapters, you know, and, and the thing is that if you hire a ghost editor, I only work with editors who have recently worked at book publishers or who've been literary agents because they know the market. So you really want somebody who knows the market and who understands exactly what, um, <clears throat> you know, editors are currently looking for, but that's a really good way to do it, you know, and, and I've used ghost editors to sell almost all my books. It's like sort of my secret weapon. Um, and if anybody emails me, I can recommend ghost editors. I mean, it probably would be best if you're just starting out. And if you've never taken a writing class, taking a writing class would probably be a lot cheaper and maybe better for you because you would get feedback every week from the teacher and from students. And, you know, a writing class might be 500 or $800, whereas a top ghost editor, I mean, you know, could be a couple thousand dollars or $5,000. So it depends on you know, your money situation and, and what your goal is, but really taking a writing class is a great way to start getting feedback. And, um, you know, um, and you don't take all the feedback that you get, but if you're open-minded and you hear what somebody says and you, you try it, you know, that could work. And my writing groups give me great feedback all the time. So those are some ways to test out if you have anything, you know, you don't want to write a whole book and finish it and then just send it to a literary agent. There's a big stage in between where you need to get criticism and, and whether it's colleagues or mentor or teacher or ghost editor, you need to get feedback before you send it because otherwise you'll ruin your connection with editors and agents. So here's a person that says, I am all over the place. I've been working on a fiction thriller for the longest time. I want to finish, but I also want to write about my fertility journey eventually and do a film book. I have so many ideas, but how do I hunker down and figure out which one is the one with the legs? Well, again, if you read Book Bible, I, I'm very honest about how long these kind of projects take. So <clears throat> for example, a nonfiction project is always gonna be faster, I think, than poetry or short stories or novel. Um, you know, and there's also some genres, there's no money attached and there's other genres where there is money attached. So you have to decide um, you know, what's important to you. So I'd say, you know, the cheapest, easiest way would be read book Bible, which will give you a good template. And then you really have, you know, you have to ask yourself questions. I mean, it's a little morbid, but I often say this to myself and my students, if I was going to die in six months, what do I want to leave the world? And that kind of helps you focus, you know, so if you have eight projects, but you know, you got six months to live, which is the one that's the most important to you work on that one. 
you know, which is the one you, which is the one that you didn't finish it would be a total loss, you know, so do that first, and, you know, unless you're so broke that you can't pay your rent and you desperately want to make money. And in that case, a thriller is going to be a better bet at selling than, for example, poetry, you know, so again, if you get clear on what your goal is, sometimes that'll help you. And, and again, taking a class is a really good thing to do. I mean, in my sell your first book class, I let people throw out seven or eight ideas for books and I'll say to them, what's your goal? And if your goal is the most amount of money, I'll tell them which project I think is going to sell the best. If it's, um, which is going to be the fastest, I'm, I'm, you know, I've done, my, I've done 17 books. One book took 13 years. So instead of a book launch, it got a book mitzvah and another book took four months, you know? So I have a really good sense of what genres you can write quickly and you know, what's going to take a long time. So, you know, take a class and get a mentor and, you know, ask good questions. So someone asked, okay, good question. What do ghost editors charge roughly? Um, it's, there's a huge, huge, huge range. So I had one ghost editor who, um, when I was working on my middle grade book, charged me $300 to read the whole manuscript and to <clears throat> answer a few questions. And then some top ones will charge six or $7,000 to read and line edit every single page of a whole manuscript, which is 350 pages. So there's a very huge range, um, you know, and, 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 the top ones from big publishing houses are going to charge more. So again, you have to ask yourself, um, you know, sometimes you have to spend money to make money, but so you have to ask yourself, what's my goal? What am I willing to spend to get there? And if people email me and if they're very specific, I can, I can help them. You know, so if somebody says, look, I'm broke, I only have $500. My goal is I'm working on this book. What would be the best bet? You know, then I could say, you know, I could, I could, um, uh, from my own experience, let them know what I think would be the best bet. You know, so um, so it depends. I don't think that there's, um, you know, there's not one answer. There's a lot of, you have a lot of options. You know, one of the things about my class that's starting um, on uh, January 11th is I always say the best way to launch a book is with a short piece. And of course it's way, way easier to write and sell three pages than it is 300 pages. So I have quite a few people who have, quite a few students who have sold one piece to, you know, the New Yorker, the New York Times, New York Magazine, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and literary agents and editors have seen it and said, I want your book. I want this project. So that's probably the quickest, fastest way to sell a book deal. And a lot of, it's sort of an inside secret. Everybody knows how to do it. I've sold books that way. So I would say, if you don't have money and your goal is to get a book deal the fastest, that's, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, someone asked if there's a link for how to enroll in Sue's class. Um, we, 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 we can put that in. No, no, just people have to email me. Okay, email you. Okay. And propsue123 at gmail.com. Okay. I'm writing a memoir and working on getting it, pieces of it published to build a resume and eventually get an agent. Should I try to get the pieces in literary journals or in popular online publications? To me, there's a top 10 that just always is going to be the best. So it's going to be New Yorker, New York Times, Washington Post, you know, Harper's, New York Magazine, Wall Street Journal. I mean, the biggest circulation places I think are going to be the best if your goal is to get a big random house type book deal. Um, you know, if your goal is a literary press or if it's, you know, if it's very poetic or you know, um, then maybe, maybe literary journal would be better. But, you know, the thing you have to remember about literary journals, and I have a, um, you know, a degree in poetry, is if you get a yes from a literary journal, it might take two years, and then they might pay in copies. Whereas if the New York Times likes a piece, you could send it in Tuesday, it'll be out Wednesday. So I keep that in mind. You know, that's a, that's a huge difference. I'm a very impatient person. So I, um, I, uh, I'm very conscious of what, what one could do quicker. In fact, I call my, my writing method um, in my classes, the instant gratification takes too long school of journalism where the goal in my class is to write and publish a great piece by the end of the class. So um, a newspaper, a daily newspaper, or a webzine is always gonna be much faster than a literary magazine. So how many books can you sell at the same time? Um, say you're working on a novel and then something totally different like a memoir. Can you sell them simultaneously? I don't see why not. Uh, you can. I mean, if you have a smart agent, yeah. they will probably teach you how to pace yourself. And I did a thing where I've had a couple of times where I sold three books at the same time and I flooded the market and fucked up all of them. So I, it's not, you know, the idea isn't to sell as many books as you possibly can in five seconds. 
the goal is probably to do one book that does really great. And if your if your first book does very well, if it sells well, gets good reviews, then the chances are you'll get an even bigger book deal the second time. So again, it depends on your goal. And I did have three books coming out. I, I had three book deals around the same time last year, but it's not ideal because um, once a publication is written about a book of yours, they don't want to see you back seven months later. You know, they want to see you back five years later. So, so there really is a way, you know, depending on which kind of book it is and your, and your platform and stuff like that, it, it's much harder to sell more than one book at a time. So an agent would probably say to you, like an agent might get you a two book deal, but then your first book will come out in 18 months. And then your second book will come out 18 months after that. That's, that's a, again, depending on what kind of book it is. That's a, that's a that's sort of a smarter bet, unless you're like a Stephen King or a, uh, you know, a Judith Krantz or someone who's, uh, um, you know, John Grisham, who's proven themselves to be able to write, you know, um, you know, to, to have a huge audience. And even those people tend to use pseudonyms for different kinds of books. So, you know, I followed your career and, you know, some of your books are kind of flipping, but then you read, you know, you'll write some very, a very, very serious book, you know, um, I mean, not that those aren't serious, but I mean, they're instructional, but, um, you, you know, you write about um, political refugees and some of the struggles people have and what kind of minds, how is that different in mindset? Um, you know, it's not funny, obviously, it's, it's, and, um, are, the, are you prouder of those books or are you, are you taking pride in everything? Uh, good question. There's a line that's- I try to do good questions, okay. There's a, there's, a, there's a line someone told me once, which I like, which is you have to follow your poetry. So even if you think you know what you wanna write, sometimes you're writing something better or deeper or darker and you kind of have to follow it. Um, I guess what happened with me was I started out, well, I started out, writing poetry and I was a failed poet. Um, so that was a bummer, that was a bummer. So I kind of had to uh, reinvent. And what I, I had a, a mentor who told me that I had too many words, not enough music, but there was more poetry in my prose than was in my poetry. So after 10 years of being very serious about poetry, I, I did start doing book reviews and um, essays. And so I kind of started, uh, writing about the topics that I wrote about in poems went to essays and then they wound up in memoirs, which was my fucked up relationships with men and my fucked up addictions, my obsessive addictions. So interestingly, the stuff that really didn't do that well with poetry did better with essays and then did really well with memoir. So I wrote uh, my first memoir, Five Men Who Broke My Heart, was about screwed up relationships and Lighting Up was about screwed up addictions. So that's how, it, that's how those started. And I probably wanted to stay funny um, but then, I don't know, other things happened. Like, for example, I was teaching the class with Ian Frazier and I wanted to help Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen and all of a sudden an anthology idea came up and a student of mine, that her husband was a, um, a, uh, the editor of a religious anthology. So that's how that one happened. And then, um, I don't know, I just kind of um, kept going. And there were a few times when like I did so many books that at a certain point I would kind of burn out of my own stories because I have a pretty boring life, really. I mean, after I got rid of all the stupid relationships and stupid addictions, I've been clean and sober for 20 years. I've been with the same monogamous with the same great guy for 25 years. So maybe I needed a break, right? I ran out of crazy stories. And then, um, well, so then my addiction specialist, um, he, he loved my book, Lighting Up, How I Stopped Smoking, Drinking and Everything Else I Loved in Life Except Sex. That was at Random House. And he wanted, he had always wanted to write an addiction book. So when I was finishing addiction therapy to thank him for how much he helped me and that he really helped me sell a lot of books and triple my income. So we did a book together on Hooked, How to Quit Anything, which was his story. And that became a New York Times bestseller. And I thought, wow, that's cool. Like that somehow it sold better than my own books. And then um, long, weird story, but I, at a certain point, I, I tore two ligaments in my lower back and uh, I wound up um, in physical therapy and the physical therapist, I remember um, it's so boring and that you just have to do these boring exercises over and over. So I'm like a journalist. So I asked him a million questions about his accent. Where was he from? Kenan, and it turned out he was from Bosnia and he just had this amazing story of uh, surviving, uh, you know, 
ethnic cleansing against Muslims in 1993 when he was 12 years old. And I just said, oh my God, you got to write about that. And uh, um, I wound up helping him and uh, he wouldn't do it without me because English wasn't his first language and he had a full-time job. And so we wound up doing um, the Bosnia list together. My husband actually made a joke that the way that I structured the book, the Bosnia list was five Bosnians who broke my heart because I was very good at a certain kind of memoir about betrayal. But anyway, so that book got, you know, Viking Penguin full page New York Times review. And then when we wrote a piece, I helped him write a piece about um, during the, um, the Muslim ban with Trump, he wrote a piece about how, what it was like for the council of uh, synagogues and churches in Connecticut to save his family, kind of implying this is how America helps refugees. And we did a piece and I have a former student who said, oh my God, this is a middle grade memoir. So I'm like, what's a middle grade memoir? So that turned into um, my recent book, World in Between. Um, so yeah, so I, I mean, I love writing. I mean, like I said, I probably um, sometimes maybe run out of my own stories to tell because I've told them so many times already. So, and I have a boring life. I'm not like a world traveler anymore or anything like that. So it's been very exciting. So I've co-authored four books so far um, and it's, it's been very exciting. And they, it kind of all, um, you know, it's very exciting. It kind of all fits together for me. So if, if your real objective is to have your story made into a movie, is it ever a good idea to pitch a story first as a novel? Um, you know, Pitching a novel, I mean, you know, if you want to publish a novel, you got to write the whole novel. And writing a novel is not an easy thing to do, you know? So um, probably if my goal in life was to get a book deal based on a story, if it was a true story, um, I would probably say writing a three-page essay and getting it published in a splashy place like the New York Times or the Washington Post would be the, that would be the quickest way um, or by the way, the LA Times would probably be the quickest because all the producers, I, I've had I've had pieces option and I've had book, books option. So that would probably be the quickest way to do it. Nonfiction is much easier to write. I mean, most novels, especially literary novels, short stories and poetry, it's all about the words and the language. Um, you know, whereas commercial work tends to be more about the plot and the characters, you know, and the storyline. So nothing is ever going to be fast when it comes to poetry or a literary novel or short stories. I mean, it could take 10 years to, you know, to write a novel and that, that wouldn't be unusual. So I would say, you know, if your goal is to do something the fastest, I would say nonfiction is, is faster. Well, I, I saw, um, I went to a panel in American Association of Advancement of Science and it was on um, what does it mean to be human? And they had, um, people from Deep Mind and people from the Watson Project, and then they had the writers of the TV show called The Humans. And they said one thing that's easier for them is that they're just making it up. <laughs> they don't have to do fact checking. So they thought they thought writing fiction was a little bit easier. Well, there's a difference between genre fiction and right. literary fiction, which I talk about a lot. You know, so if you want to do a thriller or a mystery novel, um, or a YA or an MG, that's a lot faster than an adult literary novel. You know, cause I mean, basically an adult literary novel, it's all about the language. So I don't think, I mean, even with a graduate degree, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody, you know, sit down and write a literary novel within a year and publish it. That, you know, I mean, the, a debut, it's just a long process to write something that good genre fiction is a whole other world. You know, if you like sci-fi, if you, you know, totally different world, if you like, um, I think I have a whole chapter on all the different kinds of mysteries and sci-fi and thrillers and um, uh, romance. And, you know, so, so those, those genres are much faster, can be much faster. So, so my novel is set in Central America, which I know fairly well from living there, but I'm not a native. What are your thoughts on sensitivity slash authenticity readers? Um, you know, that's a really huge issue right now. And just for example, I had a student who, um, very, very talented student who was, wanted to write a book where the protagonist was a gay Latina 
and the editors and agents agreed with me, which is like, don't even bother at this point. I mean, that could be one character, but why don't you make the protagonist closer to you? Um, it, there was a huge controversy with American Dirt about that. Um, I personally think on one hand, you should be able to write whatever you wanna write. On the other hand, in this climate, if your goal is to get a book deal from a major house, you do have to pay attention to what's going on. So it is much easier to, I mean, the fact that the fact that somebody, if it's your own ethnicity, I think you're safer. But I even had a scenario where an African-American man wanted to write about an Indian. And even in that case, it was difficult. And he, and, and he was sort of advised if the African-American protagonist is closer to you, then can you write it? At, you know, there could be a lot of different characters, but don't necessarily try to embody a character um, from a different background as the main protagonist of your book for a debut that it's just complicated. It's just really, really complicated. So again, you have to ask yourself, what's your goal? So I'll, I'm gonna read some testimonials. So for people listening, whether you should take this course or not. As other, as I mentioned, Sue is great. I published two pieces, Newsday in New York. After one class, I sold two pieces. Independent and ARP after her second. An independent editor brought in on the spot when I pitched during Sue's class and went viral. Um, I also met several editors, such as one who publishes weekly, who I worked with for years. I've also attended Sue's class and are great for workshopping your pieces and getting honest feedback from her and others in the class. Um, so I guess it pays to, uh, to take your. So when is your next class? My new class starts on January 11th, and this is a five-week pitching class where I bring in 15 different editors who are open for new writers. And you know, part of what's so exciting is that nobody, when I studied, nobody really focused on publishing. It was sort of verboten to focus on publishing, and for me, that's when everything got exciting. You know, I had my undergrad and graduate degree, but I wanted to get published. So what I do in my classes, um, both the book class, the online book class, and my online um, pitch class. And, and my in-person classes, I'm supposed to go back in person to NYU in the new school uh, this year. But so I focus, I care about the writing. I have a graduate degree. I'm a very, very tough critic. I was a book critic for a long time. So I'm gonna definitely help with the writing itself. But I like to teach people the externals because nobody's really teaching them the externals. So, you know, how do you break into the New York Times or Wall Street Journal? How do you get a book deal? How do you, what's the best way to launch it? You know, so in all my classes, we're, we're gonna cover that kind of stuff. And so the, um, uh, the pitch class is really fun because I'm only bringing in editors I've worked with who are 100% open for new writers. So it's been really exciting because online I get people from all over the world, all over the country, all over the world. But I've been I've been surprised because I didn't think on Zoom people would get published as much as they do in my um, you know in-person classes, and they get published more. So it's just very exciting, and it, it's just you know we just break it down. And if you have an editor that's saying okay. I'm an editor for the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the um, Washington Post. This is what I want. I want a five line pitch. Why you? Why me? Why now? What's new? What have I haven't heard before? You know, so they're just so specific and they're just so helpful. And, you know, someone will say, OK, well, there's a study in 219. The editor will say, no, it's 2022. Don't give me a 219 study. You go find a study 2022. Now I'm going to be interested in it. You know, so it's just it's so um, you just get this feedback, um, you know, or someone will say, I want to do a piece on eating disorders. And the editor will say, well, okay, I've run 20,000 of those. What's idiosyncratic? What have I not heard before? What's your platform? Why are you the only person in the world that could tell this story? So we'll just go over all these elements. And th this is to sell a short piece. But interestingly, remember, the best way to get a book deal is to sell a short piece to a big publication and have it go viral. And in in, by, in my book, um, Byline Bible, I, I link... 27 short pieces that led to literary agents and books. So sometimes, hilariously, a lot of times the student doesn't even, isn't even expecting it to happen. It just happened recently with a student who um, I advised her, she said, what should I write for her bio for a piece that was coming in the New York Times? And I said, you're working on a book about so-and-so. She says, I'm not. I'm like, yes, you are, just write it. And um, she got it, she had a book deal in two weeks. So sometimes you get, you know, you get a great piece, especially if it's timely, there's certain subjects that editors are looking for. Um, you know, it could happen really quickly, which is exciting. There's a great article in the New York Times called No Man is a Hero to His Editor. <laughs> and a really famous correspondence between really famous people like William Faulkner and other. And 
William Faulkner wrote, um, I want to thank you for the 30 page criticism of my book. Next time, please confine re your remarks to the back of a check. So, so <laughs> I, I've editors sometimes, I mean, editors aren't always right. I mean, sometimes, um, I mean, because some editors pass on something and you submit it to someone else who thinks it's brilliant. So how do you, uh, how do you, I mean, so you have to be able to deal with rejection, but but, yeah, you also, I would say, I would say when I try to figure out, because I've had like 25,000 students over the years, when I try to figure out who's successful and who's not successful, they're definitely, there's definitely a very blunt pattern. So the pattern is the people that are showing up and writing, you know, it's a numbers game. So the people that are showing up and writing, that's a huge part of it. But a big, a really huge, another part of it is people that are open for criticism. So you have to be open for criticism. It doesn't mean that every single person who gives you criticism is equal or you have to listen to. In my particular case, I tend to read what people write to see if I admire their work. If I don't admire their work, I'm not interested. You know, other writers, when it comes to agents and editors, um, first, I tend to look at what they publish. Do I admire what they published? But another way that I, um, you know, another great way that I gauge is I listen to their feedback. And even if you're defensive, I just sort of, shut up and listen. And then I try it. I try out something that they said, and luckily I have a writing group. So just for an example, a critic once gave me the, um, the advice. I was working on um, a novel and they said, I like this, but put it all in present tense. So my first instinct is I hate present tense, especially for nonfiction, but I don't like present tense for most fiction either. But, you know, taking my own advice that I've done a lot of therapy to, uh, um, you know, to, uh, um, to, to help me with and learn. So I listened, I kept my mouth shut. So I had pages written. So I went home and I took the first two pages, which were past tense, and I put them in present tense. And I thought, you know, luckily I do have a writing group who's, I mean, they're brilliant and I, I like their work and I like their criticism. So I trust this is a long time group that I trust. So I just read two pages out loud in present tense and then didn't say anything, just said, what do you think of it in present tense? And they were like, oh my God, this pops. This is so much better. So it turned out the critic was right, but sometimes they're wrong. you know. So I would say what I do is I listen really carefully and then I try it out and you can pretty much tell if your work is improving or not. And you can also, um, you know, you can also uh, take it externally. I mean, some of my students, They'll ask for my criticism, say on a short piece or a pitch or whatever, I'll give them my criticism. They don't like it. They don't agree with me. So I'm like, well, go out there and see it. They'll pitch it to a hundred editors. A hundred editors will say no. Then they'll try my advice. And then the first time they try it, they'll get a yes. You know, so that's how you tell. And it's not as if, you know, it's not as if it's an exact science, but I will say that there are people who are really good critics out there and there are people who know certain genres, you know, so for me, since I've done so many years of um, short essays and op-ed pieces, I really have a good eye for that. I um, The line I use is from an Edie Burkell song. I'm not aware of too many things, but I know what I know if you know what I mean. So that's just my little genre. But you can hire people who are experts in a genre. Like, for example, when I was working on World in Between, I have a former student named Abby Cher, who's just a genius with YA and MG. And I was having trouble. Everybody liked the concept that I was working on with Kenan, but I couldn't get the, I wasn't quite getting the language right. And Abby's just, I, I, I adored her work. She's very poetic. So she just, I hired her and she just helped me line edit. And, and it just got a great agent and, and, a, and a great editor the next day. Cause I knew she would be the person to go to because I loved reading her own work. I admired that. So that's a good indication. You know, you always want to, if you're going to study with a writing teacher, read their work. If you don't like their work, not a good person to study with. Okay, so here's a, here's a question that says, and I'm not, this will be the last one. You mentioned how sticking with negative feelings allowed you to write books. How do you determine if the negative experiences involved in book writing are worth pushing through or are indications that book writing isn't for you? And I can kind of understand that. I mean, I know that, you know, sometimes when I'm in a dark place, I'm not producing my best work. And, um, and sometimes it might make me feel worse, so I wait. Well, what, what, but I'd like to hear your, <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I've helped a lot of people. I mean, I think I have students have published, I think it's like already 165 books in the last 10 years, some of them for as much as 500,000. Uh, so I've, I've helped a lot of people through it. I will say it is not easy to get a book deal. It is not easy to make a living as a writer. Um, there are certain temperaments that can't handle it. I mean, I truthfully, I know people who 
absolutely 100 million percent could not handle it. So there's a lot of ways that you could try and make it easier yourself. For example, one of the things I say to a lot of my students, which I do and my husband does too, which is get a day job. You know, so what happens is get either a day or a night job to pay your bills so that your life isn't dependent on and your rent isn't dependent on whether or not you sell this project because then you get a little bit, you have more leeway, you have more time. So that's one thing that helped me. So my husband's a brilliant um, TV film writer and I've done a lot of books and newspaper magazine work. We both teach. So we make a living in another way, which allows the projects more times to gel. So that's one thing that we do. Second thing, again, you can't do it alone. So if you're sitting alone in your apartment writing a novel and then it doesn't sell and then you're depressed for seven years, you're doing it wrong. You know, so one of the things you need to do, you need to find a writing community. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I mean, an MFA program is great. An undergrad program is great. If you can't afford that, take one class. I mean, a lot of my classes, like I said, I'm bringing in 15 editors for my online classes. And then there's a lot of spin-off groups. So you're getting support. So you're getting me as a, as a writer. You're getting the support from the editors who are coming to class. In my book class, you're getting editors and agents you can ask great questions to. But then you're getting a whole group of people who can be supportive. And we're all in a group on, on Facebook together. So you need to get support. Again, therapy really, really helped me. And I used to see a shrink on a sliding scale for $20 a session. And I used to work through you know, this is never going to happen. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. You know, I just, I would get rejected. I would get rejections and I would just go to sleep. I would get stoned and drunk and go to sleep for a week. You know, like I just, it was very, very hard to deal with, but slowly with, with my support group and my writing group, I started to understand that this is the process of being a writer, you know, and there's, there's a great line I like, which is successful people will do what other people want to get ahead. You know, so I had, again, I had one book, forgiveness store took me 10 years of rejection 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 rewrite revise try again try again and then it got it was my first publisher's weekly starred review it got some of the best reviews in my career and um the same thing happened with my first novel it was literally 13 years from start to finish you know so i would say um you know i personally have never given up i've definitely had frustrating time periods where i put it away for a while and do something else that's easier um, but again, so what helped me? Therapy, support groups, mentors, um, you know, revising, hiring ghost editors. You know, if you're if you're working with top ghost editors, they're really they're very honest, you know, and if you're going to pay somebody professional. And, and by the way, I recommend amazing people who can email me, um, uh, you know, who you can email and ask questions. But somebody somebody just hired one of the ghost editors, I said, and he said to her. Uh, he had a first novel. He had a couple of novels he's working on, but he had a first novel. And he just said to her, do you think this could sell to a big house? And she said to him, um, I don't, I don't think there's enough plot here. I can't, I, I wouldn't have bought it at double day. I think you're, you know, it's interesting, but I no, I wouldn't have bought it. So he just made a decision that I'm not going to pursue this. Maybe he'll pursue a different project. But again, so part of the beauty of going to um, mentors, teachers, um, writing group critics, or ghost editors as you get honest feedback and you could say what's the what you know what would you suggest um what do you think would be the best path do you think this will ever be published um you know and sometimes i'll say to somebody um i don't think a big publisher will take this but let me tell you about some small publishers or have you ever considered self-publishing which i don't usually recommend to a lot of people but every once in a while Someone will write a book that you spent years on it. They absolutely love it. They don't want to give up on it. And there's also hybrids, you know? So there's sort of like She Writes Press, for example, where you could pay $7,000 and they put out your book and it looks absolutely gorgeous and they help get it reviewed. And, um, you know, it's it's a hybrid press, but it's very well thought of, you know? So there's, there's lots of alternatives. So I think one of the benefits of having an editor or a, um, a mentor, a teacher um, that you can ask questions is that, you know, there's... There's not one right answer. Okay, so I'm going to stop you there and. Um... Well, so let me give some information if people want it, if you don't mind, David. So right. if anybody, okay, so if anybody wants to email me, I quit all my addiction. So now I'm addicted to email. So you're allowed to email me at profsu123 at gmail.com. And I answer all my emails, and night is always better than day. So you can always email me. And um, oh, I love it when people follow me on social media and I post every time an editor and agent is looking for new material or, um, you know, there's job postings and staff writer or whatever. So follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. 
And um, I have this new class coming up, this exciting new class is coming up on January 11th, um, which is the five week um, pitching class. Hopefully my book, Book Bible will be, um, if you order it now, hopefully you'll get it within a few weeks. They did, they got it in the warehouse, but it's just taking a long time. And also Byline Bible is teaches people how to publish short pieces, whereas Book Bible is for a, um, a long piece. And um, yeah, and, and I would say just in general, I always like to say to people that um, getting published is the most exciting thing in the world and it is doable. I've never met anybody in 25 years of teaching who can't get published. It's a matter of learning a hundred stupid little rules that nobody teaches you. Um, but I think every single person who's ever struggled and then finally gotten published will tell you not only is it worth it, I always say clips are like crack. You can't have one. They'll just keep going and going and going. So sometimes it does take a long time to break in. But once you do, it's thrilling and exciting and, and you never stop. And um, yeah, and, and, and I think the trick is really, there, there's something called a change agent. So you want to get a mentor, a teacher, a critic, a ghost editor, someone that's, you know, a coach, just someone that's going to like help you along the finish line. And that's, I've, I've, I've been very blessed that I've had great people along the way. So I like to pay that forward. Okay. So, um, uh, I, you know, Joe and I run a group, group called Science Writers in New York, and we help a lot of writers too. So if you want to join, our website is... You had Lena on, Lena Zeldovich. Yes. yes She's a right. former student. Yeah, I loved her book. She's a former editor for me. Oh, so, wow. Science Writers in New York. And um, so next week, um, I wanted to um, discuss this new variant, and I'll be talking to on um, Thursday the 13th at 7 p.m. I'll be talking to Mark Mulligan, who is at NYU. He's a um, infectious disease expert and a vaccine expert. And we'll learn all about this vaccine, you know, the new variant, which is a million cases today. So it's getting pretty scary out there. So everyone, first of all, I wanna thank Sue Shapiro for, you know, this is the second time. Throat, had a little here. bit of a sore throat, but it, it, it held out. <laughs> we did very, very well. Um, the, the, actually, the, one, of my, one of my guests was the NIH director who um, ran the Moderna trials. And he emailed me and said, I feel horrible. I'm, I'm sorry, I've lost my voice. And he couldn't talk. And it turns wow. out he, it turns, he tested himself for COVID, but he didn't have that. He had just a really bad flu. But um, so these things do happen. So anyway, um, thank you yeah, so thank much. Thank you, David. This is, you ask great questions. This is so much fun. And seriously, everybody email me. I promise I will answer every single email. She, she does. So th thanks again. And uh, again, on the 13th, we'll be talking about um, all the variants that are out there and hopefully about the vaccines. Okay, thank you for everyone for your great thank feedback. You. Happy New Year, uh, everybody. Happy New Year, and um, again, stay safe out there. And, th and th thank you, Joe, for running this behind the scenes. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And, th and this will be on YouTube for people who could, missed it or would like to see it again. Okay, cool. take care, good night, and- Thanks, David. Feel well, okay, bye-bye. Thanks.